Welcome to the Radical Truth Podcast. I am your host, Glenn Meldrum, and this podcast is brought to you by In His Presence Ministries. Visit us on the web at www.ihpministry.com. This lesson will be the 60th in our study of the Gospel of Luke. I have really been enjoying this series, and I know that I will continue enjoying what the good doctor has to say about the historical Jesus. We are presently digging into chapter 11 and have thus far studied the first 10 verses. Verses 1 through 4 are an outline of what we need to pray about on a general basis. Then in verses 5 through 8, Jesus gave a parable to illustrate the necessity of fervent, persevering prayer. The final two verses we studied in our last lesson were about the privilege of prayer that the Lord gives those who are His genuine followers. We are commanded to ask, seek, and knock, all of which pertains to passionate, relentless prayer, and there's no way that we can do this without a passion burning in us for the things of God. Until something of eternal value grips our heart, we won't become persistent in prayer, persevering until we get an answer. There isn't genuine revival in the land because the church is content to live without it. She doesn't have a passion to persevere in prayer until revival comes or Jesus returns. Our lukewarm condition is killing us and leaves the mass of humanity rushing to hell. Jesus was teaching us how to move the heart of God in prayer, and if anyone knew how to do this, it certainly would have been God incarnate. Jesus knows what he's talking about, so he can take his advice that passionate, persistent prayer gains the promises of God, and the absence of it leaves us in spiritual poverty. There are three more verses in this portion of Luke's Gospel where Jesus teaches on prayer, and these consist of two short parables that further illustrate the dynamics of overcoming prayer, which is followed by a final application. The first short parable or illustration is found in verse 11. Which of you fathers, if your son asks for a fish, will give him a snake instead? Jesus is pressing home the very important truth that the Father wants to answer the prayers of his children when they are in unity with his will and heart. This is just another of the many reasons why we need to have a sound biblical view of God and his attributes so that we can know what pleases and displeases him. A distorted view of God will always pervert our prayers in one way or another. This will cause our prayers to be left unanswered by God, which is always our fault and never His. One expression of this is when people think that God is unapproachable. This will cause people to live at a distance from Him or to approach Him in unbelief, doubting if He even hears us. Then you have those who know that God is infinitely holy, yet fail to comprehend that He has made a way for us to boldly approach the throne of grace. This can happen for many reasons, such as the practice of sin, unbelief, which is sin, or thinking that we are too evil for God to respond to us in a favorable way. Another distorted idea about God is thinking of Him merely as a friend, while failing to grasp what it means for Him to be infinitely holy. Any flippant attitude in approaching God is arrogant presumption and will separate us from Him rather than draw us near to Him. There are all kinds of erroneous beliefs about God, and each one will keep us from approaching Him in a way that's acceptable to Him and is worthy of who He is as Almighty God. When Jesus gave us the outline of prayer in the first four verses of chapter 11, He gave us a simple teaching on how to approach God in prayer. In the parable of the relentless intercessor, He was teaching that we need to draw near to God with proper passion, desire, and perseverance. In the two verses on asking, seeking, and knocking, Jesus was pressing home the necessity of coming to Him with something that moves us, such as the need of others or some great need in our own life. It's great need in one way or another that can fill us with a relentless passion to gain what we are seeking after. Jesus is pressing home the fact that the Father wants to answer our prayers and that seeking Him with a passionate heart can move His heart to answer our prayers when it's in keeping with His will. Jesus introduces God as our Heavenly Father, and this relationship only belongs to those who have been genuinely born again. The biblical definition of being born again has nothing to do with the cultural pop religious ideas where people remain unchanged. Being born again is a spiritual and moral revolution that transforms people, and if this hasn't happened to you, then you're not a genuine follower of Jesus. Only those who are in right fellowship with God can legitimately call God our Father. The phrase, which of you fathers, reveals that among those he was teaching, there must have been some fathers. Remember, this teaching is taking place in the private home of Mary and Martha. 
The Lord is appealing to a father's heart to illustrate that God, as our Heavenly Father, has a perfect, infinite desire to be a father to us, who will do us good, not evil. Earthly fathers are naturally depraved. Yet most fathers, if a son asks him for a piece of fish, won't give him a snake instead. Can you imagine a cruel and wicked father that would deny his son the necessities of life and instead give the boy something that would poison him? It's unthinkable. God, as the perfect father, can only give good gifts to his bona fide children because that's who he is in character. The problem we have is that we don't always know what good is or what's good for us. God is a good and compassionate parent to not answer those prayers of his children that would harm them and to answer those that will be for their true good and eternal welfare. As a loving and compassionate father, he is looking for every opportunity that he might shower his affections upon his sons and daughters. The second short parable or illustration is similar to the first. Or if he asks an egg, will he give him a scorpion? Here again, God won't deny us what's necessary for life and godliness to give us something that would kill us. These two illustrations are saying the same thing. The thought is repeated to give emphasis to this teaching. This principle is throughout the Bible. When statements are repeated, it's to give emphasis to what's being said so that we pay close attention. Jesus saw the need to press home the truth that the Father is a good, benevolent parent who's working for our eternal good in ways we can't even imagine. The Lord is truly for us, not against us, and this is why we can trust Him with our life and eternity. Jesus' final words on prayer in Luke chapter 11 give some practical application to what He's been teaching. This is found in verse 13. If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask Him? Who is Jesus talking to? Well, His disciples. He's not talking to the unsaved masses, and we need to understand this point so that we know what Jesus is teaching. He told the disciples, If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children. It's clear that Jesus is calling his disciples evil, and this is in reference to their depraved nature. The Greek word indicates degeneracy from our original spiritual and moral condition in how God created us. It speaks of how we're not merely people who willfully sin, but we are diabolically depraved in who we are. Since we are wicked by nature, yet can have natural affection to give what's good to our children, then how much more is this true for God, who is infinitely perfect in every way? We really need to grasp this truth, for it's an important key to earth-shaking, persevering prayer that gets an answer. How can we pray to a God that we think is cruel, harsh, vindictive, or unfeeling to our needs? We are prone to make God in our own image, instead of us comprehending that we were made in His image, and that His image in us has been mutilated due to sin. Jesus is helping the disciples to comprehend the truth that God is good, that He is more trustworthy than the best of earthly fathers. Because life gets hard and persecution for the faith comes into our lives doesn't mean that God isn't good. Just as a hungry son will ask a father for some food and his father will give him enough to satisfy his hunger, so the Heavenly Father will give us the Holy Spirit when we hunger after the Spirit. Let's look at a couple of expressions of what it means to hunger for the Spirit of God. First, the Holy Spirit is a sanctifier, and when we hunger for personal holiness, we are hungering for the sanctifying work of the Holy Spirit in our life. Second, the Holy Spirit is the baptizer, and when we hunger for the baptism of the Holy Spirit, then the Lord will make sure we receive this gift and find the benefits that come out of it. In both of these cases, faith is a necessary component to receiving from the Lord what we are asking. Another way we are to hunger for the Holy Spirit is for His power to be poured out through us for signs and wonders so that Jesus is glorified and the lost are saved. The final one I will mention is when we hunger for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit in revival that both awakens the church and saves the lost in great numbers. Jesus is giving us a promise that our Heavenly Father will give us the Holy Spirit when we are thirsty after the work of the Spirit in and through our lives. The Lord wants us to be convinced of this, even in the face of trial and temptations. If we ask, seek, and knock according to God's will, and we are doing so with great desire, then Jesus promised that we will receive the Holy Spirit, who is infinitely greater than any earthly treasure. This brings us to the end of Jesus' teaching on prayer in this setting. 
We now move on to the next account, which goes from verse 14 on through verse 36. The story begins with Jesus casting out a demon, which leads into a confrontation with some religious Jews and the teaching that comes out of it. We are given the setting in verse 14. Jesus was driving out a demon that was mute. When the demon left, the man who had been mute spoke, and the crowd was amazed. In Matthew chapter 12, we find what may be the same event, but Matthew doesn't tell us when and where this took place. There's also the possibility that these are different events that only share many similarities. Matthew's setting comes after Jesus healed a man with a withered hand on the Sabbath. Christ's antagonists were Pharisees in this account. The Pharisees responded with such hostility to this miracle that they began plotting how they might kill Jesus. Since it wasn't the Savior's time to be sacrificed as the Lamb of God, Matthew recorded in verse 15 that when Jesus knew they were going to try to kill him, he withdrew from there, and great multitudes followed him, and he healed them all. In Matthew's account of casting out a demon that inflicted muteness happened either during the time Jesus was healing the multitude or afterwards in a different setting. What Matthew wrote isn't clear enough to know where it took place. This is also one of the cases where a demon is said to cause a particular malady, and in this case the man was unable to speak. The fact that healing a mute is possible with God is supernaturally confirmed in the stories like the conception of John the Baptist, where the angel of God smote Zechariah with muteness for his unbelief. We learn from this that demons can inflict certain kinds of maladies upon people, and in this case it caused muteness. For the man to become demon-possessed, he had to somehow open himself up to demonic activity through whatever sin he was practicing. All muteness isn't the result of demon possession. Sometimes it's due to sickness, disease, birth defects, or traumatic experiences. Muteness that's a result of demon possession happens through the practice of sin. In Matthew's account, we are told in verse 22, Then they brought him a demon-possessed man who was blind and mute, and Jesus healed him so that he could both talk and see. In this case, a demon-possessed man was mute and blind, and this difference with Luke's account is one major reason why these may be two different accounts. When Jesus cast the demon out of the man, his speech and sight was restored. People can only be demon-possessed by opening themselves up to demonic activity to such an extent that a demon or demons can enter into the life. Demons don't have the right to possess people who haven't opened themselves up to demonic activity. God has set boundaries that demons can't cross, and this is for the well-being of mankind. Yet when people rebel against God to such a degree that they cross a spiritual line, they give through their sin permission for a demon to enter them. It's not that people have to verbally invite the demon into them, though some people have actually done this. All they have to do is delve into evil to such a depth that they have opened the door for demons to enter them. Sin is more serious than what most people think, and it can have some terrible consequences, such as demon possession and the horrendous torment that it produces. In Luke's account, Jesus cast a demon out of a man that caused him to be mute. As is the case in Purpose with Miracles, the people were amazed at Jesus. This is really a great response to Jesus, and this happens to everyone who puts themselves in the place to see who Jesus is and what he can do in the lives of repentant sinners. When miracles take place, demons get angry. When they are cast out of people, they get really angry. When demons get angry, they look for some way to retaliate, for they are really hateful, vengeful devils. One way they express their hatred and anger against those who do damage to their hellish kingdom is to rile up those whom they have control over. In the account we are studying, this is exactly what they did with some religious Jews. Some angry devils stirred up some proud religious people who became instruments of hell in attacking Jesus. We see this in Luke chapter 11, verse 15. But some of them said, By Beelzebub, the prince of demons, he is driving out demons. Instead of rejoicing that the demoniac was set free, their jealousy was aroused and they began to strike out at Jesus. Their pride was seriously wounded because none of them had been used to perform a single miracle, cast out a demon, draw such crowds, or had such a following, and they hated Jesus for this. It's like lukewarm, self-professing Christians that don't have the fire of God burning in them and want to put the fire out of anyone who does. There's another account in Matthew that's similar to what we are studying in Luke chapter 11. It's in Matthew chapter 9, verses 32 through 33. While they were going out, a man who was demon-possessed and could not talk was brought to Jesus. 
And when the demon was driven out, the man who had been mute spoke. The crowd was amazed and said, Nothing like this has ever been seen in Israel. In this account, Jesus had just raised Jairus' daughter from the dead. Then he healed two blind men. And as he was leaving Capernaum, some people brought to him a man that was mute through demon possession. Of course, Jesus cast the demon out and the man spoke, which was the initial evidence of his deliverance. Then in verse 33 we are told, But the Pharisees said, It is by the prince of demons that he drives out demons. This must have been a common accusation that was brought against Jesus, and not something that only happened in Luke's account that we are studying. The event that happened in Matthew 9 took place earlier in our Lord's ministry, while the one Luke recorded happened towards the end. With this in mind, Luke's story may be a totally different event from the two that are recorded in Matthew. At the same time we read in Luke chapter 11 verse 16, others tested him by asking for a sign from heaven. If you get some devils angry, it might be like whacking a hornet's nest, where the hornets come out in a frenzied attack, and this is what seems to have happened to Jesus. The Lord wasn't intimidated by any of this, for he knew who he was and what he came to do. They would have no power over him until it was time for him to be offered up as our substitute. I have long thought that the argument of these religious Jews was absolutely ridiculous. They have seen Jesus do miracle after miracle, and nothing like this has ever been done in all of human history, yet they are asking for a sign. Something similar happened in Matthew chapter 16, verses 1-4. through 4. The Pharisees and Sadducees came to Jesus and tested him by asking him to show a sign from heaven. He replied, When evening comes, you say, It will be fair weather, for the sky is red. And in the morning, today it will be stormy, for the sky is red and overcast. You know how to interpret the appearance of the sky, but you cannot interpret the signs of the times. A wicked and adulterous generation looks for a miraculous sign, but none will be given it except the sign of Jonah. Jesus then left them and went away. The Pharisees and Sadducees weren't seeking to know the truth, because they already thought they knew it. They thought that they were experts in the law, but they were willfully ignorant of just how spiritually blind and dead they were. They also thought that they knew the Word of God, yet refused to see what the Word taught about Messiah, and that He was standing before their very eyes. They asked for a sign to prove who He was, but enough signs had already been given them if they really wanted to know the truth. They were hostile to Jesus because they were hostile to the Father, whom they claimed to be their God. The only sign Jesus said he would give them was the sign of Jonah. It appears that he didn't explain what that meant, but I imagine that they extensively discussed this among themselves. As Jonah was three days in the belly of a whale and came out alive to preach to the people of Nineveh, so Jesus would be three days in the grave and rise again to proclaim the power of the resurrection. Yet even though he told them what sign they needed to look for to know that he was the promised Messiah, they refused to believe. The judgment that came upon them due to their persistent unbelief is terrifying. We are told that Jesus left them and went away. Their refusal to believe all the signs that had been given them and their hostility against Jesus caused the Lord to leave them in their sin and ignorance. The truth has been given to us. What will we do with it? Embrace it or reject it? For it's either one or the other. There's only one truth. Yet the lies of moral relativism that claim that we all have our own truth has overtaken our culture and even whole portions of the church. Yet it's the epitome of ridiculousness. There's truth and there's lie. Jesus is the truth, God incarnate, and all the signs point to this fact, and that he died for our sins so that we could be forgiven. All those who reject the truth of who Jesus is, and that he is in absolute terms the only Savior, will find that he will leave them alone in their rebellion. And this is the worst judgment that could ever befall mankind. It is the reality of hell. Then in verse 17 we are told that Jesus knew their thoughts and said to them, Any kingdom divided against itself will be ruined, and a house divided against itself will fall. One of the nine spiritual gifts that Paul wrote about in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 is the word of knowledge. This is a supernatural gift where people through the Holy Spirit can know the heart, thoughts, or life of an individual. This knowledge comes from the Holy Spirit and is given for a specific reason, such as the salvation of a person or to boost their faith so that they can believe for a miracle. This isn't what Jesus was operating in. It wasn't a gift, but his divine right to operate through the inherent power where as God he knows everything. 
How this worked through Jesus during his earthly pilgrimage, we don't know. What we can know and need to grasp, that God is omniscient, which means that he knows everything there is to know and that there's no limit to all that he knows. Just as Jesus knew the thoughts of those religious people, so he knows our thoughts, motives, sin, and righteousness. Those who aren't right with God should tremble over this truth because he perfectly knows everyone, and this will come out at their judgment. Those who are right with God should find both comfort and concern over this truth. The comfort comes through knowing that the Lord knows everything we go through in life. He is there in our suffering and joy, in our trials and victories. Everything we go through, He is right there with us. This is also where the concern comes in, because He perfectly knows us, and knows when we sin or refuse to trust and obey Him, or the wicked thoughts that we let go through our minds. For those who belong to Jesus, this knowledge, though it should cause us to tremble with godly fear, should also give us hope that He is patiently working to prepare us for the day that we must give an account to Him. Jesus responded to the religious Jews with some simple logic. A divided house is sure to fall, and a wicked kingdom will ruin itself. History is full of accounts of kingdoms that were divided and eventually came to ruin, and we have ample enough evidence in our divorce-cursed nation that a divided home will self-destruct. This holds true for the church as well. A divided church will ruin itself, while unity brings the peace and anointing of the Holy Spirit. This is so simple and basic that it's obvious that the religious Jews were saying this in an effort to turn people against Jesus. Anyone who thought this through would easily conclude that there's no way that Satan would cast a demon out of a possessed person since it's contrary to the agenda of hell. Jesus expounded on this simple yet profound thought in verse 18. If Satan is divided against himself, how can his kingdom stand? I say this because you claim that I drive out demons by Beelzebub. There's a type of unity among the hordes of hell which is based upon their mutual obsessed hatred for God. Hate-filled devils must hate each other, but their hatred of God unifies them in an effort to harm God by perverting those who are made in His image. If their mutual hatred of God didn't exist, then there would be no unifying force to keep the hordes of hell together. The religious Jews must have been shocked that Jesus knew what they were saying about Him, and that they might have even looked for a betrayer among their ranks. Jesus was merely demonstrating his divine right as God, and the religious Jews were too blind to understand this. Then in verse 19, Jesus made his argument very personal by stating, Now if I drive out demons by Beelzebub, by whom do your followers drive them out? So then, they will be your judges. Don't mess with Jesus, because you can't win against him. It's not just that the religious Jews had abandoned logic for absurdity. They had condemned themselves through their own irrational arguments. We know that there were some religious Jews who strove to cast out demons. I haven't done the research through studying ancient rabbinical writings to see how effective they were in casting out devils. But when we see the story in Acts chapter 19, verse 14, we find that the seven sons of Sceva, a Jewish chief priest, were doing this. Their effort ended with disastrous results. A demon spoke through the possessed man, saying, Jesus I know, and I know about Paul, but who are you? Then the man who had the evil spirit jumped on them and overpowered them all. He gave them such a beating that they ran out of the house naked and bleeding. If a person doesn't have a deep abiding life in Christ, they better not attempt casting some demons out of a person. Jesus mentioned that the religious Jews said that he cast demons out through Beelzebub, and I want to take a moment to explain who this is. Beelzebub was the idol of Ekron, and the name signifies the Lord of the Flies or the Dung God. This was probably a derogatory name given by the Jews to this debased form of idolatry. It may be that the place where the people sacrificed to Beelzebub was infested with flies, which the Jews claim that God's temple in Jerusalem never had a problem with. Beelzebub should be understood as a reference to the prince of devils, which is Satan. It would seem that this vile form of idolatry continued into our Lord's time. To associate Jesus with Beelzebub gives very strong proof of the malicious hatred the religious Jews had for Jesus. The Lord then ramps up his argument in verse 20 declaring, But if I drive out demons by the finger of God, then the kingdom of God has come to you. Our Lord's defense is simple logic and a powerful argument. There were times when Jesus didn't defend himself. The fullest expression of this took place at his sham trial and execution. 
This time Jesus defended himself to testify to the blind guides concerning who he is. Why did he do this? So that they would be given another chance to turn, repent, and be reconciled to God. The finger of God is synonymous with the Spirit of God, which Matthew recorded Jesus saying in chapter 12. In Exodus chapter 8, we see the plague of frogs and gnats that came as judgments on Egypt because of the pride of Pharaoh. In verse 19, the magician said to Pharaoh, This is the finger of God. But Pharaoh's heart was hard, and he would not listen, just as the Lord said. Here we see the finger of God refers to his might and power being revealed. I think this is an interesting expression of the infinite power of God. All he has to do is move a finger, and the most powerful nation in the world is brought to its knees. Some commentators said that what was being manifested was the work of demons under the infinite authority of God. We have no idea what kind of power angels have, whether good or evil. But when scriptures reveal their power, we can see that it is very significant. The power demons possess is restrained by the infinite power of God, and they can't cross the limits the Lord has set according to His will. The times he does use demons is for the sole purpose that his name would be glorified. All we are told from this account in Exodus about the ten miracles that brought deliverance to Israel from Egypt is that it was the finger of God, and we don't have the right or knowledge to say how that works. With the final plague on Egypt, we are told that an angel of death was released to kill all the firstborn of Egypt. If the Lord can create everything with a word, then he obviously has no need of help in accomplishing his will, whether from men or angels. To illustrate what Jesus has been saying to all those listening, he stated in verses 21 and 22, When a strong man, fully armed, guards his own house, his possessions are safe. But when someone stronger attacks and overpowers him, he takes away the armor in which the man trusted and divides up the spoils. This simple parable illustrates that to drive out demons, there must be one stronger than the demons who are possessing the person. And since Satan's kingdom isn't divided, he won't drive demons out of them. The conclusion is simple. God is the only one who is greater, and he is doing this work. Since Jesus isn't casting devils out in the name of his Father, but through his own inherent power as God, then there's proof that Messiah had come to the people. Like Pharaoh of old, that refused to let Israel go, so the religious Jews were doing the identical thing, and their judgment would be the same. This is always a sad end of rebellion against God. This doesn't have to be the tragic end of anyone. Thank you for listening to The Radical Truth with your host, Glenn Meldrum. We at In His Presence Ministries pray that this weekly podcast will be a blessing to you. Please tell others about it and subscribe yourself to this free podcast. Don't forget to visit our website at www.ihpministry.com. See you again next time, and may God richly bless you as you seek Him in spirit and in truth. And thirst no more, so come wash in the river, come drink your fill.